leaving Eric behind. Hannah goes on a solo adventure. Sometimes she does this while looking for some feathers. Thank you for tuning in to Hannah and Eric Go Birding, a podcast by birders for birders. I'm Hannah, and he's Eric. We created this podcast to share adventures, sometimes misadventures, and opinions that we have on different birding topics. We're definitely not experts in anything that we discuss that might be controversial. We want you to remember that our own opinions they might be different from yours. Very good. Very good? Very good. <laughs> uh, so, well, yeah, well, your song was good. It, it, it definitely alludes to the fact that you're leaving me behind. Wow, okay. You want to talk about those CVCs that you did a couple no, years ago? I know. I know. You need to go on lots of adventures. All those fire calls you go on? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There. Just payback. <laughs> All right. Uh, Eric's firefighter, by the way. Volunteer firefighter. If we haven't mentioned that before, that's why he goes on fire calls and leaves me alone at the hotel while he goes and saves lives or whatever, or, you know, or, shoes, or, you know, whatever I'm doing, shoes elk out of the way and, you know, <laughs> like responds to false alarms. So, Hey, n- nine out of 10 calls are false alarms, but that one out of 10, that's, that's something really save a life. I feel like it's 9.75 times out of 10. It's a <laughs> false call. Well, I mean, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. So, anyways, um, there's some news. Uh, we are going to the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival, and this will actually drop while we're over there. So, um, if you are there, you know, say hi, and yeah. we'd be excited to meet you. And we're looking forward to it, because we actually have some targets that we're hoping to get. Yes, going going somewhere new. Or new, Ish. because it's new for the season. We've never been there in the summer. That counts. It's like a whole different place. It's like a whole different place. It's like, it's, yeah. But they still have El Charo, so we're definitely going to go to El Charo. Oh, for sure. That's going to be good. Yeah. I'm excited for their carne seca. Get some, some uh, beef. Dried in the Sonoran Desert Sun. Sun sun dried meat. Sun dried meat. I mean, I like sun dried tomatoes, but. (laughs) Uh, Besides that, we're going to the Rio Grande Valley Birding Festival, and we were super excited to be poking through like the the schedule that they put out the other day to see that one of the events is like breakfast at uh, Sable Palm with Hannah Bushert and Eric Ostrander. It was like, oh, that's a surprise. Yeah, it's a surprise. It'll be fun. Yeah. Breakfast. Yeah. Breakfast of birds. Yeah. Um, beside that, in our last episode, we talked about the dark skies and the Perseid meteor shower is happening this week. So we've got August 11th, 12th, and 13th is when it's supposed to happen. Yeah, so, which is actually when we're recording. That's tomorrow, the next day, and the day after that. Yeah, so get out and look at the stars. Um, the shooting stars is super cool. By the time you listen to this, it'll today will be the last day of the peak. We hope you have looked at some stars. We will hope you have looked at them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, that's it. fun. I'm excited to go see it in the desert. Oh yeah, that'll be that'll be fantastic. I'm excited to go out tonight and see if we can. At least see a little bit. You think there's going to be a pre-show? I think there'll be a pre-show. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be it's not going to be the super exciting peak, but maybe maybe we'll get one or two. Um, we can watch it in our backyard. Yeah, we can. And since our last episode came out, this is just a bit of personal news. We moved into our house. Yeah. So that's been very exciting for us. Oh yeah. So aside from personal news, and oh, I guess there's more personal news anyways. But uh, we met uh, <laughs> met up with a bigger burger. Yesterday, just the other day. Yeah. Um, when she was in town, Tiffany Kirsten. We had uh, we had a little snippet from her earlier this year. Um, when she donated uh she's one of her birdie she's devices. birdie devices. Yeah. Um, and she swung by Cannon Beach just the other day just to come down and see Tufted Puffins because <laughs> she she had she had missed him on a pelagic that she went on. So she was she just happened to be like as a big year birder says in the area. She was she was only seven hours away. So she was like, oh, I'll swing in and get another bird. <laughs> <laughs> so we are saying, you know, we're the, the best place to see Tufted Puffins. So if you're doing a big year, mm-hmm. you kind of have to swing by and see us and we'll help you get the Tufted Puffins. So yeah, we, we have uh, put we us have, on the map. We have Tufted Puffins. We have a hot shower. We have coffee. I don't know. We don't really have donuts or muffins usually, but uh no. But but if uh, we have an idea that you're coming, we could have donuts or muffins ready. Yeah, just tell us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a smorgasbord there ready for you. Yeah, tuft, tufted puffins, and then, then you get get on with your day and go find uh, some more rare stuff. Yeah. 
Which, um... Speaking of her stuff. <laughs> and I feel bad about mentioning this because Tiffany missed it by a couple hours. Uh, but yesterday on August 9th, uh, we got an alert at 11.43 on the WhatsApp. While we were at Costco. Yeah, which actually worked out great. We randomly had our binoculars with us, which we don't usually carry them in the car. Um, if I don't know why. Oh, it's because we were bringing them back to the house from the hotel. Yeah. That's why That's why we had them in the car. And then we just, we were like, oh, well, we need to go shopping. So we went up to, to Costco, which is about 45 minutes from us. And um, because we're in a rural area, <laughs> so everything's a little bit further. Um, and we got this WhatsApp notification that a redneck stint had been seen in a flock of shorebirds. Yeah, pic- pictures and everything came through, so it's like, oh, this seems legitimate. Like, where exactly is it? Yeah, and on the way back from Costco, um, we went on the beach, and there's sections of the Oregon beach where you can go uh, driving on it. Yeah, most of the beach you can't drive in Oregon, but there's this there's a section up north, up where we're at, and then there's another section down south, uh, down by Florence, that you can drive. So, um, luckily it was easy for us to just, like, get out there, drive on the beach, and uh, see see what we can find. Yeah, so we we got on the access that um, was closest to us, just headed south until we found a shorebird flock. And after, you know, arguing with each other for 15, 20 minutes <laughs> about, is this it? Is it not it? Because it's something that looks very similar to a sanderling. Yeah, so it was, it was definitely it. It was, there was a group of sanderlings. Well, I mean, by definitely it, I mean, like, <laughs> it's not a bird I'm familiar with, <laughs> based on field marks on the, in the field guide and all that stuff, like, pr- pretty sure this is the right bird. Um, we're, we're looking at the bird, it's slightly smaller than a sanderling, you can see a defined eyebrow, mm-hmm. you can see a little bit of a tinge of red on its throat and neck, um, and it was, like, Hannah got a picture, kind of, we didn't, terrible picture, terrible picture, because we, we didn't have a scope, so we couldn't, like, hold the lens still so she's trying to hold her binoculars at the same time as holding the phone and it's just a whole mishmash but uh you can see it's hanging out with the sanderlings the sanderlings do not have a rear toe that sticks out a hallux and the stint does have a rear toe so you can see as they're running around you had a picture of both the sanderling and the stint next to each other and you can see the size difference and then the the one that has a hallux it's totally a Zapruder picture. Though. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, without great. without having the context of already knowing that that's what we were looking for, and that in that picture you can't see any colors, you can't see any, you can't see the eyebrow, you can't see any any additional markings, like, you'd be like, I don't know, it just looks like a, maybe, maybe that's a sanderling that's further away. It's like a runt. <laughs> yeah. Like, but, I mean, it's, like, that would be, that's like the final field mark of, like, five field marks that we're trying to, trying to see on this yeah. guy. So it was su- super exciting to That was a lifer. See. It was a lifer, and it's a, for, for those not in the Pacific Northwest, that's a rare bird. And for those, I guess for those not in Asia, that's a rare bird. Or, well, or, or Alaska. Or Alaska. Yeah, because the range in the U.S. is in Alaska. But I think it's only during migration. Yeah, and it was, I, so it took, it, it literally took me like 45 minutes to find the Merlin bird pack that contains... <laughs> redneck stint because i was like okay well it's not any of the u.s ones none of the u.s packs contain it i was like okay well what about the western pale arctic because they show up in uh sweden and uh finland Mm -hmm. nope it's not in the western pale arctic pack (laughs) and i'm like "Ah." so so then i'm like i was like arbitrarily just like downloading everything i could find in the (laughs) northern hemisphere before i finally downloaded the beijing pack yeah and it was in the beijing pack so so that's it, where you get it normally, Beijing. I guess I, I I'm sure there's probably I I probably skipped over some packs because I didn't assume it would be in there, but then it it probably is in other packs. But yeah, yeah. So it's not a not a common bird for uh for the United States. Well, and that's something that I think is really cool about where we're at. So like, I've been really down about like Oregon. You know, like oh we don't get as many cool things as when we lived in Texas. Um, because a lot of the rarities that would come through would be like Mexican species, Mm -hmm. uh, which tend to be, you know, like prettier and bigger and more interesting. Uh, but then we've had a number of rarities show up here in the Pacific Northwest that is like, you know, Arctic species. And so, and so like, they're not necessarily like the biggest and prettiest or anything like that, but it's just, it's cool how the rarities that you get in an area 
like differentiate from each other. Like we're not going to get a Mexican species up here, but we we might get a handful of different things that you'd see like in like in Asia or in Alaska. Yeah. Well, and it, it's also um we we're talking with Tiffany about this that it's it's like a whole different birding culture in Oregon versus like Texas, um specifically like southern Texas or uh like eastern southeastern Texas that uh like if there's a rare bird like, it'll be seen for a couple days, and then it won't be seen for, like, a couple weeks. And that's not to say that the bird disappeared. It's just that the the 17 birders or the 30 birders in the area already went out, saw it, got their fill, and then now there's maybe one birder still going out there and refinding it every couple of days, and that's it. Yeah. And, like, in, in, down in South Texas, like, that bird is being looked at every single day. It's being reported. It pops up on the rare bird alert on the hourly report every day for like six times every single day Mm -hmm. and then here in in oregon like the redneck stint yesterday somebody else found it before us took some pictures we went out there a couple hours later we were the second people on site um we saw it our our uh rare bird alert was the first one to come through because the other guy hadn't uh hadn't hadn't posted it yet so it looks like we found it so it it looks like we (laughs) found it but our comments differ they say they say we were not the first ones to find it we give credit to the original finder oh for sure I i mean there's no way we could have like I, I we would have kept on driving like oh yeah. like a group of sanderlings yeah exactly um but then then another group went out there later they didn't find it then the next group found it and only one person out of that group posted it mm-hmm. so it's just kind of like there's there was only three rare bird alerts for a bird that seven people saw yesterday yeah so it's I mean e- e- birds used heavily it's just uh, not used as I guess religiously. Well, and I think that's I interesting know. because you know thinking about the tufted puffin, like Tiffany was the big ear birder. Tiffany, she was in Yakima, Washington, which mm-hmm. is you know a pretty good drive from us, and she was looking at eBird because she needed tufted puffin. That was her tar- one of her her targets for coming up, um, and so I was looking at like we were messaging back and forth, and I was looking at eBird for Tufted Puffin, you know, up and down the coast to see, like, oh, maybe there's a place that's closer to her that would be more, that's more reliable. Yeah. And we were looking at all the places in Washington, and they haven't been seen there since, like, July. And it was like, you know, somebody was on a ferry and saw it. Yeah. So they're not reliable sightings up there. But then I looked at our hotspot, Haystack Rock, where I know they're going to be there. Like, it's, if it's I go a, out there... It's a guarantee, essentially. If, if we go out there between April and August, like, we're going to see them. And I know there are people that miss them, um, you know, because there's not as many of them out there. And maybe, you know, if we're more familiar with looking at them, I guess is the yeah, thing. Yeah, but they're, they're up there. They're nesting. They're there every day. Yeah, but... So it's, it's, a, it's a lock if you know what you're looking for. Them. Yeah, but like we went out on April 9th with Tiffany mm-hmm. and the previous... Sorry, August 9th. The previous sighting that was there was August 3rd on eBird. Even though I know they're there every day. It's yeah. just that there's not people out there e-birding it every single day. And so it doesn't look like it's as reliable as it actually is. Yeah, that's that's true. So it's And I had seen it the day before. Like, I went out on August 8th. Mm-hmm. Um, I went down there with my sister because she wanted to see a puffin. I just didn't e-bird it. And so I went back through and posted an e-bird <laughs> list because I was like, I know I saw him. I was just being lazy and didn't do an e-bird yeah, list. Yeah, so, so the honor is, is also on us for not uh, not posting lists more frequently. Yeah. So I hate to have more and more news because um, I know the banter, you know, not everybody likes the banter. <laughs> but I also want to point out the new Merlin app. Uh, addition to their app that they put out recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. We uh, haven't even talked about that. Yeah, and we haven't really played with it either, but... It's it's summer. We're busy. Yeah, but it's super cool. They have used all of this information that they've collected from from birders and people who have submitted to, like, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology Sound Lab. Yeah, the, um, the Macaulay Library. The Maca- thank you, Macaulay Library. And they've added this portion of Merlin where you can hold up, I imagine you hold up your phone mm-hmm. yeah. and to a bird that's calling and it can, you know, closely identify that species. Yeah. It works just like any of the other sound apps that I've, I've used in the, in the past, uh, song sleuth or bird net, they, you hold up your phone, you take a recording and then you select the section of recording you want, you want it to identify. And then it tells you what bird it is. So it's super, super cool, super easy to use. And I've used it just on two birds and both of which I deleted the the thing because I was I was using it compared to a 
recording from my computer because oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to see how well it worked identifying a recording, which it does really well at identifying a recording. So I can't wait to get some time to like sit in the backyard and use it to try to identify like the Anna's hummingbird that's chirping. See yeah. if it see if it can pick that up. So, um, question about it: Do you know if there's an option like after you do the recording? And then it identifies it to submit it to the Macaulay Library. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, that was that was the super interesting thing is that you can submit, you you record it, and then you can. I I haven't done it yet, but yeah. you can, as far as I can tell, you can just drag it right over to a list, and it'll create a list with just one species, that bird, with a recording. That's cool. And then it'll submit that to the Macaulay Library. So okay. then that that becomes part of the record. And part of the algorithm that they use to try to put together bird calls. Yeah. So well, that you can identify it. And those other apps are really cool, you know, that they do similar things like that too. But this is great because it consolidates it all into a program that so many people already use mm -hmm. with Merlin. Because they use it as a field guide. They use it to submit photos into. And now you can submit these sounds. So it just yeah. kind of aggregated all of the, the really cool stuff into one. Yeah, it's 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 pretty exciting. They're tr They're trying to... They're trying to monopolize, I guess, which I'm fine with. <laughs> I mean, it's a college. It's not really like a... <laughs> That's true. It, it, it is a college, and it's all research, and it's all... Um, we're, we're contributing to the research by taking these recordings and taking these photos and putting them on there. And, like, another aside about that is bad photos and bad audio is really good for the for the program because it can, it can help better identify good recordings yeah if you have bad recordings in there too it can help the system learn better yeah yeah so one star one star recordings and one star pictures are definitely still worth posting okay cool <laughs> um so we didn't have any reviews on this one uh last little bit i think of stuff before we move on to the main thing is the bird nerd giveaway for for this month for august um, and this one is because we're talking about tufted puffins and, you know, the survey that I went on. Okay. So this, uh, bird nerd giveaway, uh, is to win a plush tufted puffin courtesy of the friends of Haystack Rock, which is the, the board that I sit on. And to win that, what we are asking that you do by August 24th, tweet, Insta, Facebook, email, whatever, a picture of you contributing to science. Any, any kind of science. There's lots and lots of expect, acceptable responses to this. You don't have to um, be out there, like, you don't have to be out there banding or capturing a wild bird to take measurements or, I don't know, measuring nest cavity sizes and Or like, and you know, solving, forest. solving cancer or anything yeah, like you that. Yeah, you don't have to do anything super crazy. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't even have to be bird science. Just science. Contributing to science in some fashion. Um, you can be out birding, you can take, taking pictures, bird banding, like any, anything. iNaturalist. iNaturalist, yeah, any, any, anything you can think of, but send a selfie and or picture. Of you doing it yeah. somehow, in some fashion. Of you sciencing. <laughs> Don't overthink it, or you could totally overthink it and send us something like super wild that we would have never imagined. Yeah, that would be, that'd be even better. Just something weird that is like. <laughs> No, you convince us that, that that's you sciencing, and and if you can convince us you sciencing, then that's then that's good. So submit or post a picture using the hashtag uh, hashtag bird nerd giveaway by August twenty fourth, and then we'll we'll give the winner a plush tufted puffin. So thank you to the friends of Haystack Rock for uh, participating in this with us. If you feel so inclined, check out their website, which we'll put into the show notes as well, and check out the cool things that we do, and even buy some of the gear that we sell. Like the super plush, fancy sweatshirts you guys have there. I know, that say so protect soft. the puffins. Yeah. Yeah. Those are, I need one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were just complaining about how many sweatshirts and jackets we have. I know. But I need all the sweatshirts <laughs> of varying thicknesses. <laughs> Every possible thickness of sweatshirt. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to get on with the main story. Main story. What you're all here for. Um, so this was really exciting. And like we said, this is, was more of a solo adventure. So I sit on the board of the Friends of Haystack Rock here in Cannon Beach, Oregon. And our mission is to promote the preservation and protection of the intertidal life and birds at Haystack Rock. 
So some of the cool things that the Friends of Haystack Rock do is they uh, they support um, they support a lot of different research. So they have um, they have a number of scientists that they help fund their research mostly on puffin stuff because puffins are pretty uh, um, integral to like education on Haystack Rock to yeah, getting people interested. Everybody wants to come see one. Our town has puffins all over the place. Some of them are the wrong puffin, but you know that's that's okay. That's that's the way it goes sometimes. Sometimes sometimes you get the wrong puffin when you when you commission an artist. And we're so lucky to have an incredible amount of species that live on Haystack Rock. Um, we've got black oyster catchers, pigeon guillemots, three species of cormorants, harlequin ducks, and just a variety of different intertidal species like sea stars, sea anemones, and nudibranchs. And if you're not familiar with the nudibranch, they're they're sea slugs. That and are some of them are really pretty. Oh my gosh! There's this one, the um, the opalescent nudibranch. Yeah. Uh, That's like the more common one. It's, yeah, it's super common. Like, I, I feel like every time we go down to look for nudibranchs, that's what we find. Yeah. And we don't find any others. But <laughs> it's so interesting because it's like this little translucent, like, sea slug that is like maybe two inches long. When they're like, gi- when the giant ones are like two inches long. Yeah. And they have like these, uh, these horns all over them. That then have like multicolored like orange and pink like sort of little tufts at the end of the at the at the end of the translucent horns. So it's just like this really interesting looking like ghost like <laughs> like woo, 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 across the across the bottom of the tide pool. And I'm sure if you put your head underwater, it would make that sound. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Well, you to the <laughs> of all the um the little, oh barnacles the barnacles doing their thing, and then you hear <laughs> as this guy's like walking along. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's definitely what would I mean, happen. If if you ever stick your head inside a tide pool, you hear all <laughs> sorts of things. Some things you don't want to hear, but you hear all sorts of things inside a tide pool. There's something silently screaming like ah. <laughs> It's probably it's probably something being eaten by a sea star. Probably. Um, and I know we've talked about this area a lot, uh, but we do get a lot of visitors to Haystack Rock, so it's super important that uh, the work that we do to try to protect and preserve and educate visitors about these cool species that live there and help to, you know, create stewards of our environment. So as, as Eric mentioned, as a friends group, we partner with a variety of organizations, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, which we've partnered with a number of times, too. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Because the rock and surrounding marine garden are part of the Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge. And there, like Eric mentioned, there's a number of scientists that we work with frequently because of our lead charge right now is Tufted Puffins. We've designated this the year of the puffin. The year of the puffin. And so we, um, and I mean, just on and on, we fun scientists to do things and they do a lot of surveying for these species and they also try to um attach you know like the transmitting devices so we can find out more about the species uh they do burrow surveys like go into the burrow and like try to pick out like fecal matter so they can figure out what the species eating but do you you know the details of how they get back to the or was it, is it like one of those claw things, like, for picking up garbage on the... Well, I saw a picture the other day, and they just, like, stuck Stick their, their arm, arm in there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, because, so, like, puffins, they could they could be, like, up to six feet deep. Yeah, I'm I'm sure they have an idea of, like, <laughs> how deep it is when they get going like, on Like, it. They, they send one of those, like, uh, little fiber optic, <laughs> like, things with a camera, and they go down and, like, just grab some poop off the yeah, side? Yeah, probably. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, so there's a lot of science that's going on because tufted puffins in what we call the California current here are in decline. And we did do an episode about tufted puffins a couple of years ago. So if you want to learn more about them, go back and listen to that episode where we interviewed a scientist, um, one of the board members with that's on there with me, and then a volunteer researcher. So they have much more information about tufted puffins than we're going to provide right now. Yeah. Yeah, because so, this is this is more about Hannah's adventure, not... Uh, my adventure! Not about the science of puffins. So this year, um, they were able to get out and do some surveying, which they, you know, have issues doing every once in a while because of things like COVID and then, like, weather conditions and sea conditions and funding and we were able to help them get this boat surveying going. So they were able to 
um, do it this year. Because you guys funded the gas for it, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so it, with, without the um, Friends of Haystack Rock, there wouldn't have been any fuel for the boat to get out there and do the survey. Yeah. Yes. And okay. so because of that, I got a seat on the, the boat, which is very <laughs> exciting. They also do helicopter surveys, which seem pretty cool. So I don't know what I have to do to get on one of those helicopter surveys. I guess you have to fundraise more. I'm going to have to figure that out. <laughs> Anyways, um, I was lucky enough to fill a seat on the boat survey, and I was actually able to contribute, so I wasn't just along for the ride. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's everyone, because it, it was a small boat, like, it's, everybody had a job, right? It's a Boston Whaler, I think is what he Boston called it. Whaler. Like a 32-foot Boston Whaler, which right. doesn't mean anything to me, because I don't know anything about boats. So those boat aficionados out there, it was a Boston <laughs> Whaler, a 32-foot I'm Boston pretty, Whaler. I'm pretty sure. That's what they said. And then, and then we're going to get made fun of because it, like, that's not Boston Whale is not even a boat. That's not a boat. It's not a boat type. I think that's just a brand of rum. We're talking about something. it. It's a Chicago Whaler, obviously. <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> obviously, we know a lot about this. Um, so I get to Garibaldi. That's where we're launching from, which is about an hour south of us. I got there at about 6 o'clock in the morning, so mm -hmm. it was an early morning for me. Um, I met Sean, who is the, the lead researcher on this. Noah, who is a grad student at Oregon State University, uh, doing tufted puffin research, trying to figure out the food that they, the prey that they're after and what they're successful in getting. And then Alyssa, who's an intern with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So Sean getting there, Sean did a great demonstration of all the safety features. I mean, he got an A plus for this. <laughs> like he showed us every single safety feature on the boat, including how to get into a survival suit. So which... like survival suit, like what they have on like the, um, the d deadliest catch where it's like the, the whole flotation thing you climb inside and it's like keeps you in like the stay puff marshmallow sort of thing. Uh, basically. Okay. Yeah. So I feel pretty confident that I can get into one of those now because of Sean's <laughs> great teaching of that. They also brought me a float coat, which I was joking that with Alyssa, it made me feel like I was on the Sea Shepherd because, you know, the big jackets that they wear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, uh, it's a, which is a great item to have. I had never, you know, been exposed to float coats before and we've been on pelagics, but mm -hmm. it's warm, it's puffy, acts as a life jacket and also acts as a little bit of a, um, like a padding for on the boat because the boat was a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got on, on the water, got the boat going and just tr went about an hour North, um, which, you know, got us up to right outside my door. <laughs> just like I drove <laughs> so an hour down to get on drove a boat. Drove down to get on a boat to come right back home. Yeah, pretty okay. much. Um, but it was so cool, you know, just seeing the coastline from that angle because I had never, you know, been out on the Oregon coast, like in the water, you know, where we live. And so there's all these features that we see normally when we're driving or, mm -hmm. you know, on the beach or whatever. And I got to see it from the backside. So Niakani Mountain, does that look as menacing as from the ocean as it feels like it looks from land? It does. But Cape Falcon does not. Really? Like it was, yeah, it was really weird going into Cape Falcon or going past it because there's a Marine Reserve, the Cape Falcon Marine Reserve. Mm -hmm. And it just did not look like nearly as big. Like I had trouble picking out where Short Sand Beach was. Oh, really? Because it seems like a lot smaller when you're out on the water. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So that was. I mean, it's a small cove, but. It is, but it seems like really big when you're standing there. Yeah. Because, I mean, it's like it's half, a half a mile, mile yeah. of beach. Hmm. So, yeah. That was really cool. Um, got up to Haystack Rock, which, you know, Haystack Rock, oh, uh, big, beautiful rock, which does not look the same on the backside. Like, <laughs> I mean, pulling up, it's like, is that really Haystack Rock? That, that's not the shape it is. Yeah. Um, and right when we got there, a bald eagle spooked the common murk colony. And oh, so no. they just waterfalled off the rock into the water. <laughs> Which was super neat to see, but also kind of disappointing because it's like, oh, this is going to make it all so much harder. Because now there's nothing on the rock to count. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, we did have a couple tufted puffins like fly past, but we didn't see them up in their burrows, which was a little disappointing. And like I mentioned, we all had a job. Uh, so Sean was driving the boat. You know, mm -hmm. that's a pretty important job. 
Um, one person was, was counting burrows, one person counted birds in the sky and the water, and then the third person was looking at the habitat to see if there were invasive species or habitat changes that could have influenced um, tuft and puffin uh, nesting or usage of that area. Yeah, so what was your job? Um, it was the, the habitat. The habitat? Yeah. Okay. And I was also supposed to take pictures, but we didn't, there wasn't really any changes to any of them, so we didn't take any pictures. Oh, okay. Uh, but it was really cool because they have a tablet that has this computer program on it to enter all that data into. Yeah. Which I get, like, on a, you know, laptop. For me, like, a laptop is like, oh, yeah, it has a program, whatever, like, somebody created it. But the fact that it was on a tablet was, like, super cool to me. It's like, wow, somebody here is an app developer. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really neat um to see haystack rock from the backside uh i could see all the people on the beach and it's like haha i'm out here you're not <laughs> i'll say and i imagine we were all standing on the beach kind of minding our own business and didn't even care didn't yeah, even notice probably not you're out there laughing at us and we're just like doo, doo, doo. <laughs> we're, we're we're watching the wa- waterfall of mers i didn't i didn't actually go out then but we're watching the waterfall of mers and you're watching it and and sides. they were flying over us. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even notice you were there. <laughs> um, so then we jetted north a little bit further to what's called Bird Rocks uh, here in Cannon Beach. It's like on the north side of Cannon Beach. And there are other rocks out there that are super cool, but they didn't have any puffins on them either. They had more, you know, cormorants rocks. and pelicans and, and murs. Um, so then headed back south. Mm-hmm. And there, I, I don't, there weren't any other stops. Did you see any like rhino auklets or we did. cassins or anything? We saw, yeah, sorry. There was a lot of rhino auklets that were flying past. Okay. And, which was super frustrating because I didn't get a good look at any of them. Yeah. But it's like, I know what they are. I just, I didn't get a good look. I was really hoping for a parakeet auklet. That was like that my been, goal. That would have been super cool. Yeah. So I had Sean watching out for that. I was like, <laughs> while well, you're driving, <laughs> look out for this. Just don't hit any rocks on the way. I was trying to hold on. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, I was fortunate that I had one of those scopola bean patches Mm -hmm. uh, behind my ear because I I don't normally get seasick, but I put one of those patches on my ear because sometimes I do get sick, like, when I wake up really early. Like, I feel, you know, sick from waking up too early. I don't know. Um, But I did put one of those patches on, and, I mean, I had, like, the best sea legs. (laughs) Like, I was fine. (laughs) Well, you're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, But poor Alyssa did get very, very sick. So, unfortunately, we had to drop her off halfway through because, I mean, she just, like, ah, I felt so bad for her. Um, So, I get really seasick. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I guess I'm lucky in my seasickness that I don't get... Like, the pathetic type of... Debilitating? Yeah, debilitating, like, just, like, laying there, just, like, feeling awful. Like, I just get... I just get very vomity. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I'll just... I'll do my business, and then I'll go back to birding. And then, oh, no, here we go. Do my business, and then go back to birding. So it's... And for, for for me, like, if I take a bunch of Dramamine, then I get really sleepy and kind of, kind of a little out of it. But for the most part, like, for me, it's just kind of, like... It's this inconvenience on the side that's like all of a sudden I'm like oh no leave me alone for a second and then I then I go back and just everybody look away everyone look away I have some business to take care of <laughs> uh, and granted I mean it was pretty choppy when we were out there yeah so I could yeah you definitely would have been <laughs> sick while we were out there and because it was such a small boat you know like yeah. we were really subject to a lot of the waves and when we were headed out there like it was kind of like boom. Boom, boom, like on the waves because yeah. we, you know, full throttle. <laughs> See, I don't do it's 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 when it starts doing the like the three axes, oh, like okay. it's like the, the 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 pitch, the yaw, and the roll. You get all three of those going, yeah. and it's just like. Mm. But uh, and when we were stopped, like it definitely was like that. I, I can I can imagine if it, if it was choppy when you were driving and then you stop and then all of a sudden you're just going upside down and all that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and, but, but part of the cool thing when we went to go drop her off, like we kind of slowed down in the, the bay right there and like at the, the headwaters of the bay. And what was really neat was the water coming out of Tillamook Bay, how like 
the color differentiation between that and the ocean water where they meet. Yeah. I thought was one of the coolest things I've ever seen because the water coming out of the bay was like this like light blue color and then the ocean water was like black and there was like a definitive line of like this is bay water and this is ocean water. And like I've seen pictures of like Brazil like that, like where the Rio comes out and meets yeah. the ocean and how it has this channel of water that goes out and like, you know, I think the Rio water is like real muddy or something like that. And so that's part of the the color difference. But this was or, like... Or like the Mississippi or the Columbia. Yeah. Because I, I, I know I've seen pictures of those two. Okay. I don't know that I've seen the Columbia. Yeah. But... The Columbia looks pretty cool. But it's it's like this giant plume that like goes way out. That Yeah. That's what this looked like. And huh. it was just so neat to see it like from the water. Yeah. And I don't know that I've ever noticed it when we go on a pelagic at any other place. But I'm definitely going to be looking for that from now on. Because that was just really interesting. Yeah, that's that. That is really cool. Yeah, the that that would be interesting because like the what what I can picture is I can picture the Mississippi, which I've seen, um, aerial pictures of that, and it's like a muddy plume yeah. coming out, and then the Columbia is like what you were describing, like a like a clear plume coming out into the into the deeper darker water. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, it would be interesting to pay attention the next time we go out at other, at other places. Yeah, I mean, I there was like you could just draw a line. <laughs> in between the two of them. Um, like, you could pick up a glass of that water and be like, this is going to be fresh water. <laughs> probably not. It's probably still salty. It's brackish. Um, so anyways, we got back on the water and we went south from Gear- Tillamook Bay. And that took us to Cape Mears, which um, Cape Mears is one of my favorite places on the Oregon coast. Because there's this really beautiful lighthouse that you can just, you can go walk through and it's not very tall. Um, but it's just a beautiful headland and also, uh, Bay Ocean Spit, which is the section on that's north of Cape Mears. It's a really good birding spot and it's a fascinating location too, yeah. because it used to be a town <laughs> until it got flooded and yeah, until it was abandoned. And so now there's this, it's not even like a housing project anymore. I don't think it's, there's nothing out there. Oh, well, there, there's remnants of structures out there but it's just like a huge sandbar now that has yeah house or that has uh trees and stuff and it's like a five mile long spit um that you can park and then like ride your bike into or anything but Mm -hmm. i think the reason and i'm probably wrong here but i think the reason that the town was you know destroyed and abandoned was because of like the building of the jetty yeah so i i remember reading this when we were out there a couple years ago the so Bay Ocean Spit, they built they built this town. It was supposed to be like a completely self contained, like amazing, like utopia sort and of town. And this is like in the twenties. Yeah, think. this is a long time ago. Um, they they built this town on this spit because it was like, oh, this looks like a perfect place to build a town in the spit in the middle of a bay. Um, and then when they were developing the entrance to the bay, they built the north north jetty first or south jetty. They built one of the jetties first, and then that caused um, the sand that the that they were on to start washing out and the water level to rise. And it was like, Oh geez. So then it started flooding everything and everything got like ruined. And then when they built the second jetty to finish, to finish the project, like 20 years later, they, once both jetties were completed, all of a sudden, all that, the sand came back up and all the water receded and they were, the, everything was exposed again. So it was like, Oh, now it's buildable again. <laughs> But it, it was just interesting that they just, like, they, they had this town, they had uh, an auditorium, they had a school, they had everything out there. I think there. there was, like, a theater out yeah, there. All, all this stuff. And then they completely ruined it by building one jetty. And then then when they built the second jetty, they re, re uh, made the area viable again for building. Yeah, just, Atlantis came back up yeah, out of the ocean. Came right back up out of the ocean. Um, so, yeah, all the details of that are fuzzy. <laughs> but it's it's just a really cool partying place. Um and I think we talked about it in one of our episodes, too. I think we've been... Yeah, I think we went out there and talked about it. And Cape Mears is just south of that. And it, like I said, it's gorgeous. It has this, um, like, you're on top of the headland. And when you walk down to the the viewpoint... So when you walk down to... I, I think it's like a cove, but it's like it's like a high, rocky cove. So you're like... <laughs> a, a, co- a cove with 200-foot walls. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> like, you're 200 feet above the water, and it's just this big inlet sort of thing. Um, and there's just birds all around. Mm. And so that's super cool. And so there's a couple of rocks just off of it that, you know, we'd noticed before, but we didn't yeah. really ever pay much attention to. And those were the rocks that we were surveying. Oh, okay. And so there's one called, I think it was called pyramid rock. And we did like a big loop around that. Didn't see any puffins. 
um, went along the shoreline because these were a lot of these were historic bur um, puffin burrow locations, oh, okay. or they were places that they could possibly be. And so when we were out doing this, we were looking for existing puffins. Um, we were looking at old colonies, and we were looking at potential new colonies. And just trying to survey all of the rocks as part of the Oregon Islands National Wildlife Refuge okay. in this section about whether or not, you know, puffins are present or absent or were present and no longer there, yeah. you know. So just trying to figure out, like, where the population currently is. Okay. And so we had them at Haystack Rock and we did all of this around um, Cape Mears uh, with Pest Lighthouse, which was neat. Um, and then we... That was kind of the section that we were looking at doing for the day, uh, but because it was about noon, and that's kind of when tufted puffin like activity slows down, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't really like worth going out looking because they might be there, but you might not see them. Yeah. Um. So we didn't want to ruin you know any data with that. So Sean did want to go check out Three Arch Rock National Wildlife Refuge, which is the coolest place and some place that I'd never really even thought about yeah um because it it's off the shore a little bit you can see it from cape mirrors so when you're standing you know uh, at the lighthouse but also there's a section on the south side uh -huh. of that like kind of tree grove um where there's like this really horrible trail <laughs> to yeah. walk up it wasn't that horrible it's just really steep and yeah. like i feel like the sidewalk was kind of it's, it's a very uneven sidewalk that is it does kind of feel like it's falling off the edge of the cliff yeah basically Anyways, from there, you can see Three Arch Rock, but it's not as impressive as when you are underneath Three Arch Rock. Yeah. Did you take any pictures of this? I took a ton of pictures. Okay. Um, so we'll have to post those on the Facebook with, yeah. with this episode. Yeah. And so it's a 15-acre refuge, and Sean did want to like reinforce with us that this area is closed to the public because it's a puffing site for stellar sea lions. Yeah. Um, so it's closed because of those things. And because we were doing an official survey with the U S fish and wildlife service, yeah. we were able to make a closer approach oh, okay. than most people can. So please keep that in mind. Um, unfortunately it's offshore, so it's not easy to access anyways. And it's closed to the public, uh, for public entry year round and waters within 500 feet during breeding season. And we'll post, you know, the, the refuge website too. So if you want to find out more details about that, you're more details to. about how you're not supposed to be out there. Yeah. Um, but it is really an impressive site. Uh, it's these three large arch rocks that are out in the water. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they're ginormous. And when we approached them, the, I saw like 15, 20 puffins. Like really? Noah and I were in the boat and we were like, I, I mean, he wasn't as excited as I was about it, but I was like, puffin, puffin, puffin. And they were all like flying above us. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, yeah. There's like, he's like, there's like 20. And I was like, I saw like nine. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a pretty, um, I mean, not, it's not a good size colony of tufted puffins out there. Is it bigger than Haystack Rocks? I think so, but oh, okay. we'd have to find out from the survey whether that's actually true or not. I saw more puffins there than I have seen at Haystack Rock okay. in the past couple of years. So that's good that they have this protected place, you know, that yeah. you can go out to. Um, however, that doesn't necessarily, you know, mean the species is like saved because there's a lot of factors that go into why tufted puffins are in decline. Yeah, which I, I feel like that's the same with any of any migratory species. Like you talk about the birds that fly north and south, migratory, migratate. Mi migrate north and they south. They migrate. They migrate. Uh, mi migrate north and south. Like they go all the way down to South America, Central America, Mexico, stuff like that. If they're protected really well in the United States, and then they go spend half their year somewhere else, like they have to be protected really well there. Otherwise, yeah. and this is the same thing to the puffins. Like we might protect their breeding spot, breeding spot really well, but then their wintering grounds. Yeah. Like, how well are those protected? Well, and, and how, it's not how just... well are they fi fished? How much, how well are they stocked full of food? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's not just that either. I mean, like, sure, you know, that habitat might be really good. Yeah. But when they're going out and finding fish for their babies, like the quality of fit and the amount of fish yeah. isn't necessarily that great. Like they're bringing back a lot of squid for mm -hmm. their babies. 
And I think it's that squid isn't like as nutritious. Oh, I, as... I, I figured squid would be really good, but well, maybe I'm wrong on no, that. No, I'm, but I'm, I it's don't know. they're like seeing that the, there's a change in yeah. like what kind of uh, prey that they're bringing back to yeah. their babies. I guess squid are mostly membrane. You'd be like eating, eating a lot of membrane. It's like a lot of water. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's probably not as fatty as like a fish, like a smelt or something. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, but anyways, know. it was, we, you know, toured around there, we had lunch, and then we headed back to Garibaldi Bay, and, or Tillamook Bay, Garibaldi in Tillamook Bay, but that was just one of the neatest experiences, you know, that I've had. I love being out on the water, and I just think it's super cool that we were able to participate in the survey, survey with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife yeah. Service, so I am very thankful to them. I'm also thankful to the Friends of Haystack Rock for... Um, you know, doing these partnerships and trying to further science about species that we care about. So I think that's really cool. And also our board president, Angela, who um, was, you know, really, uh, really adamant about, you know, making sure that we can participate in things like this. Yeah. And yeah, that's really cool. I, I really, I envy that the organization you're part of actually, actually is doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> The, I, I feel like I've been on a number of boards and stuff that are just kind of like, oh, yeah, we'll talk about doing things and maybe maybe we'll donate the money that's to, to this. And we spend a lot of time talking about stuff. But then you guys are actually like, OK, you donated seven thousand dollars to this project. And then that project it has a physical result of your you have a scientist out there putting transmitters on puffins or trying to put transmitters on puffins mm -hmm. or, or or you're going out there and supplying the fuel to do a survey. Yeah. yeah, I just think that's interesting. Yeah, and you know it's a completely volunteer board. We don't have uh, any paid staff, so we do what we can in the time that we have available. And you know, I wish I had more time to to commit to it. Um, hopefully, you know, in the the winter when things slow down, I can commit a little bit more time. There is no more winter. I know <laughs> things don't slow down anymore. I know this is Cannon. This is Cannon Beach's just, new new future. I'm just hopeful. <laughs> Um, so that was a lot of fun. I really appreciate, yeah, like I said, Fish and Wildlife for bringing me out with them. And, um, yeah, it was cool. Yeah. So well, I'm sorry you didn't get to go. It's but... okay. I do lots of things by myself. I know. I, I, I do lots of fun things. I, I go put out fires and whatever, whatever else I do. Uh-huh. Yeah. So just stuff. <laughs> just like, I just put out fires, things. you just go count puffins. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so is that it? That's that, that was your adventure? I think that's my whole adventure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it cool. was exciting. I had like you know wonky legs the rest of the day because it was like I feel like I'm on a boat still. <laughs> you, you you have your sea legs and you can't get your land, land legs back. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, see. I love being on the water. <laughs> <laughs> I feel more comfortable. Yeah, on the ocean, except the whole time I'm still a little scared. It's like I'm gonna get sick any minute now. No, it's oh. like if this boat floats, what am I? Or if this doesn't. If this boat goes down, what am I going to do? If this boat decides to stop floating, yeah. how am I going to float? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, gosh, that's going to be such a long swim back. You know, and that was part of the, the nice thing is that we were so close to shore. I had cell phone service the whole time. Yeah. Well, I, I had trouble with the password for something. I had I texted you and you were able to reset the password. I know. Yeah. 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 Well, anyways, uh, thank you guys all for listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and or learned something new. Please, please, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Music, and anywhere else you listen to us. If you'd like to connect with us on the socials, you can connect with us on Instagram at Hannah Goes Birding or Eric Goes Birding. Hannah with an H, Eric with a K. Yep. Um, you can also connect with us on our Facebook page, Hannah and Eric Go Birding. Um, send us an email at um, Hannah and Eric Go Birding <laughs> at gmail.com. And Lots check, of in that. check out our TikTok at Hannah and Eric Go Birding. <laughs> Is it Hannah and Eric Go Birding or at We Go Birding? No, I think it's Hannah and Eric Go Birding. And, Eric Go Birding. and then our Twitter is at We Go Birding. Yeah. And then our website, www.gobirdingpodcast.com. <laughs> Lots of different ways to get a hold of us. Basically, Go Birding is kind of a general theme for all of our stuff. So if you can uh, if you can find us there, you can find us anywhere. Yeah, and uh, do the Bird Nerd giveaway. Bird Nerd giveaway, yeah. Tag, uh, hashtag Bird Nerd giveaway and get some pictures of you sciencing. Yeah, so thanks for listening.